yeah okay i'll take that as a yes um great so thanks everyone for coming it's a, it's a pleasure to be here thanks a lot for the invitation to talk about uh, my work in this workshop uh, today indeed i'll be talking about principles in pre neural networks for trajectory prediction and even though i am the one here giving the talk today lots of the work and the credit is goes to Mitt Roddenberry, one of my PhD students, and Nick Glaze, who is an undergraduate that helped us with this project. Okay, uh, let's get started with this. Let me just put a timer here, just to make sure we're in time. Good. So graph-based machine learning, right? So I assume that uh, most of you guys are already uh, familiar with this notion, but let me kind of build this idea from the ground up since it would be conducive and, con and contribute to the story that I want to tell today. So graph-based machine learning leverages indeed the network structure of the data to improve learning and processing of this data. So the picture at least that I have in mind is let's say that we have a bunch of points in some space and we might have features associated with these points, right? These could be, these are people, this feature could be some demographic data or if they are acting on a social network, this would be let's say a feed, activity feed uh, that these people generated. Or if we're talking about the brain, this would be neural regions and the axis would be cortical activity in these different neural regions. And the typical picture that we have in mind is we have you know, some labels associated with a subset of these. For example, if it's people, this could be political orientation, hence the coloring here. Or if these are regions in the brain, this could be whether this region is acting normally or abnormally. And the classical supervised learning framework, right, is we essentially use the subset of the data for which we have labels. And then we try to learn some mapping from, you know, feature space into label space, let's say C1. And then we use that mapping F that we learned, it's probably parametric, so we learn those parameters with our data. And then we use that mapping to determine the label of X1 and X7. Okay. Of course, in the graph setting, we have an additional source of information, which is the relational structure be between these elements. If these were to be people, this might be part of a social network. This could be friendship relations. If this indeed is a brain, this could be structural connectivity of the brain, for example. And hence, what we want to do is to combine the information in the labels, sorry, the information in the features, with the structural information in the graph to predict the labels of X1 and X7. If you're thinking about the social network where homophily is probably present and people tend to be friends with people that think alike, then there would be you know, additional evidence to put a blue label to X1 and a red label to X7. But in principle, what we want to do is to combine the features in X with the graph structure. And this can be done through more traditional ways like graph kernel regression, for example, or through more modern ways like graph neural networks. Right? So, so this leads us to thinking in terms of graph neural networks. And in these graph neural networks, GNNs have been applied um, ubiquitously uh, or ubiquitously uh, over uh, many, many different applications over the last couple of years. And the reason for that is that there's many data that can be effectively modeled as irregular domains. Instead of being regular domains like audio and images and video, a lot of data, the domain is indeed irregular, and we can leverage the expressive structure of graphs to represent the data. So these are just some headlines, you know, that for example, Google Maps using graph neural networks to better predict the uh, ETA. Um, GNNs being used for drug discovery, for particle discovery, credit scoring, even you know, some portions of alpha, alpha folding, protein folding are at least based on ideas that are inspired by graph neural networks, etc. And the reason that these are used uh, in all these different contexts is that you know, molecules, uh, proteins, social networks, urban infrastructure, all of these are indeed very irregular domains. Okay? So it makes sense to use graphs to try to model these. So a lot of today's talk will hinge upon the idea of invariances. So let me uh, also kind of build that picture a little bit. So how can we think of graph neural networks? Okay, let's think about just CNNs. It's classical CNNs used a lot in computer vision to try to 
build on top of that. So there, of course, we have a sequence of filters, pooling operations, and activation functions. In graph neural networks, we have a sequence of filters or local aggregations in the graph, potentially pooling or not layers, let's say that not, and activation functions. But the key that I want to uh, emphasize over here is that part, at least, of the success of CNNs in computer vision comes from the fact that they can be shown to be, you know, under some assumptions, this idea of translation or shifting variance. So that if you have a cat in the lower bottom of this image, or in the top right of this image, and what you're building is an object detector, it doesn't matter where the cat is. For these two images, you want to learn this is a cat. So in that sense, if this invariance is built already in the architecture that you are designing, then this thing will learn kind of in this quotient space of translated images, which of course will be more efficient and would generalize better and scale better. Well, in graph neural networks, what we have is permutation invariance or permutation equivariance, depending on the type of output that we have. And there, the idea is that it doesn't really matter the ordering of these nodes. The only matters is the connections between them. So if we reshuffle the nodes, essentially if we re-index the nodes, we should be able to learn the same thing because the underlying physical system is actually the same. In our example with seven uh, units, it, did, it didn't matter if one and seven were the ones that were unlabeled, three or five, if we just re-index all the nodes, right? The structure is actually the same. So we want to incorporate that symmetry in our, um, in our architectures. And here the idea is enforcing appropriate symmetries helps with generalization. Okay, well, now I'm going into simplicial complexes, we'll do in a second. We're gonna keep that idea in mind and try to generalize it to these high order structures as well. Okay. So we've been talking about graphs so far. Okay, the title of the talk is Simplicial uh, Neural Networks, etc. So we'll go into simplicial complexes. And in here, we'll essentially generalize the construction in two directions. First, in terms of structure, so structure will depart from only pairwise relations to go into higher order relations. Think, for example, of emailing or messaging apps, right? We'll belong maybe to groups in WhatsApp, and these go beyond just pairwise communication. These are group communications. Or, you know, co-authorship networks, papers written by more than two people. Neuron firing, maybe you think of, uh, you know, correlations of firing, not only pairwise, but higher order correlations, etc. So this has to be in terms of the structure. And also we'll be generalizing in terms of the data. So we want data associated not only with the nodes of our graphs or our sufficient complexes, but also associated with higher order structures. We could have data associated with the edges, with faces, with volumes, etc. In particular, if we think about data associated with the edges of a graph or a sufficient complex, this is usually representing flow. Flow of signal, flow of mass, flow of energy, flow of information between agents. So if we think of urban infrastructure, we have traffic flow within a city or migration patterns of birds or of people between states or, or between countries or the flow of materials in a supply chain you know, from, from production to transportation to consumption. Good. So if we think in terms of flows on graphs, a new Symmetry kind of sort of appears, right? So if we think of a flow of a graph, it's that we have the flow in this very simple graph, and we're representing indeed a flow that goes from this node all the way to this other node. And here the blue arrow let's say we represent the flow of plus one. This would be the same object actually as a flow of minus one in the opposite direction. And it would be, let's say, the same object as this other flow that we have plus and minus ones. Of course, if we use a vector. To represent these flows, right? The vector here will be a vector of plus ones, the vector will be a vector of, of minus ones, and some zeros where there's no flow, etc. But the underlying object is actually the same. So we want to process data, we want to learn data that is defined in these higher order networks. We need to be true to this symmetry that exists there. In that way, we'll be able to scale better and generalize better. So just noting that there is this skew symmetry. For example, if the actual flow does not depend on the chosen orientation, it's arbitrary, um, then we'll try to leverage that in the construction of our architectures. Notice that this would not appear in graph neural networks because nodes don't have orientation, but edges and triangles and higher order structures do. Okay, good. So this is our road ahead. So essentially it's 10 minutes. So this is our road ahead for the next half an hour or so. 
First, we want to incorporate higher order relations, as we mentioned, and we'll do that through the construction of simplicial complexes in our models. Then, and probably more importantly, we not only want to define these structures and data on them, but actually operate, process them, maybe have some parametric functions that we can then learn, and that will hinge upon Hodge theory, in particular, the idea of a Hodge Laplacian, which I'll introduce uh, briefly. And then we want to construct networks based on these opera operations. We want to construct graph neural networks that generalize well, okay, that have good performance. And for that, we're indeed going to rely on this idea of invariances that we have already built a little bit upon. OK, so this is the menu ahead. Let's start with the first point and introduce indeed our mathematical construction for higher order relations, which is a, just a simplicial complex. So here, let me not be as precise. I'll do a little bit of a definition by drawing here. So an abstract simplicial complex, or just simplicial complex for short, is a set X of finite subsets of another set V that is closed under restriction. So what's the picture to have in mind here? So V is just my set of nodes. And X is a set of is a subset as a set of subsets. Right? So if these subsets are of size one, those are the nodes themselves. If these are pairs, those are edges. If these are triplets, those are triangles, and so on and so forth. And it being closed under restriction simply means that if we have the triangle one, three, four over here, we must have also the edges one, four, three, four, and one, three, and also the nodes one, three, and four. So that means close under restriction. Okay. And then a simplicial complex, which is oriented, can be indeed drawn like this, where we have yeah, nodes, edges, triangles, which are these field faces, those are the triangles, etc. So V are the nodes, or what we call zero simplices. The edges, which are the pairs, are the one simplices. Triangles are the two simplices, and so on. And then we can naturally define data on these structures. I mean, there, there's no problem with that. We can assign, like, let's say, a real number or a vector or something to each of these different structures. In this case, here we're assigning a real number to each node, right? So here we can think of a signal in the node space. Here we have a signal on the edge space, a signal on the triangle space, and so on, right? So this is a simple picture to have in mind. But maybe a more important question is if we have these definitions, how can we operate on data defined on k-simplices, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. So that brings us to our second question, in which we're going to spend a little bit more time, which is how to use Hodge theory to operate on this data. So for that, let me be a little bit more precise in, in mathematical terms. So here we're going to define CK as a vector space where the basis is the oriented k simplices of my simplicial complex over the field of real numbers. So we're going to essentially be attaching a real number to each element of my basis, such that C0, where the bases are my nodes, is just our traditional call graph thing or some, some information associated with the nodes of my graph. But then we can have C1, which is information associated with my edges, C2, which is information associated with my triangles, etc. Right. So if we go back. Essentially, this is an example of an element of C0, the colored nodes. This is an example of an element of C1, of C2, etc. And then we want to relate this information using just boundary operators. So these are going to be linear operators that take me from CK to CK minus one. For example, from a signal in my edges to a signal in my nodes, or from my triangles to my edges, etc. You know, people that are familiar with topology, topological data analysis, etc. I'm very familiar with this kind of operator, operators. And let me not define them formally, but these act as you would expect. Let me again just define B an example over here. Let's say that you have this element, it belongs to C1. So this is the number three associated with the directed edge one, two, or the oriented edge one, two. If we take the boundary of that, we essentially have the same number three associated with the head of that, of that edge minus three associated with the tail of that edge. Right? So essentially what you did think of taking a boundary. And this is, as you can see, a linear operator. So if we represent this as a matrix, 
this is nothing more than the well-known incidence matrix of the, of the graph, which is used a lot in um, algebraic and, and spectral graph. This, we can also uh, well define a co-boundary operator, which is just a map that takes us up in this stream of vector spaces. Good. And with that definition, we can indeed define a Hodge Laplacian. So a Hodge Laplacian delta k is something that operates in CK and goes to CK. So this is something that takes me for a signal in nodes to nodes, edges to edges, triangles to triangles. It operates kind of at the same level and it's defined in this way. So we already have the definition here. So it's defined this way, but let's try to build a little bit of intuition of what this operator okay, um, is a linear operator. What is this thing doing? Well, first of all, when k is equal to zero, okay, so del zero, delta zero, excuse me, going from the nodes into the nodes, in that case, the Hodge Laplacian boils down to the regular combinatorial graph Laplacian because del zero is actually the zero matrix and del one is actually the incidence matrix. So this BB transpose, which is indeed a way of defining the classical combinatorial graph Laplacian. So the Hodge Laplacian for k equals zero boils down to the graph Laplacian that we know and love. What happens when k is equal to one? Well, when k is equal to one, indeed we're operating from edges to edges, or from signals on the edges to signals on the edges. And in that case, both of these elements are non-zero. And here what we are encoding, or where the Hodge Laplacian is actually encoding, is that edges can be related to each other in two different ways. So let's say that we have the following very simple simplicial complex where the triangle is filled. These two blue edges, let's say, they are related with each other because they are incident to a common node. They're incident to a common node. So that part is captured by this first term. Because when you do, you know, del one times delta one times some some flow vector, this first map will take you down into the node domain, and the second one will take you back. So if two things are incident to the same node, they're going to be related. The other way that two edges can be related, for example, these, these two pink ones, apart from being incident to the same node over here, they're part of the same triangle. And that other mode of interaction is captured by this second part of the Hodge Laplacian. And this is true in general. So structures at the kth dimension can be related through the k minus one or through the k plus one. Okay. This is something that we cannot see in nodes, right? Because there's nothing below the nodes. But if, when you go to edges and triangles and so on, you need to have these bimodal type of relations between elements. Okay. And in particular, for the case of flows, the Hodge Laplacian also encodes a very natural decomposition of the whole space of signals in the nodes, so the whole space of flows. One can define the space uh, C1 as kind of an orthogonal sum of three different types of flows. Gradient flows, which are flows that can be described through gradient differences at the nodes. Harmonic flows, which are conservative flows. And curl flows, which are flows around field triangles. So these flows themselves, the basis for these flows are related to the spectral um, the composition of the Hodge Laplacian, in particular, the kernel of the Hodge Laplacian is a basis for all harmonic flows in your space. And then gradient and curl flows can be uh, seen as the images of these two operators over there. So this means that if we use Hodge Laplacian to process and to learn from data, then we are facilitating this architecture to think or to at least decompose the information in these three different spaces. And in a lot of cases, you know, some type of flows, for example, conservative flows might be more important for a specific application at hand. So facilitating this decomposition in our parametric architecture will help us learn better, as we'll see later. So this is the idea of the Hodge Laplacian. <laughs> okay, and then 
So now the idea is that now that we know how to let's say operate at the kth level, now we're gonna try to use that to build a more complicated architecture that we're gonna call simplicial complex network. That's where the SCN over here is. And we can think of this as being some operation that goes from CJ to CL. So some information at the Jth level to some information at the Lth level, which will be somewhat parameterized by something that is given, which is the all of the boundary operators, which encode the structure of the simplicial complex, so the structure of the graph, which you're thinking of just two, two dimensions, and parameterized by some learnable weights W. Okay. And then the key, of course, then we're going to train some things, and we're going to fit those weights over there. Notice that the graph neural network, we can just think of it as a structure like this, that go from zero to C zero, and this del is actually the instance matrix, which just captures the structure of the graph and some learnable weights up okay. And what we're going to do now is instead of just defining a specific simplicial complex network, what we're gonna be focusing on are on properties that are decidable for these architectures. Permutation equivalence, orientation equivalence, and simplicial awareness that we're gonna define formally in a second. And we're gonna say that something that satisfies those are we're going to say that it's an admissible neural network. Okay. So we're going to define these, and then we're going to think which kind of architectures actually satisfy these desirable properties. Okay. So this is what we are going to tackle in the next 10 minutes. So this is indeed the next point. So we want neural networks that generalize well. So instead of simply just posing an architecture and seeing that experimentally generalizes well, let's pose desirable features that promote generalizability. Okay and then build an architecture that satisfies those features, or at least uh, determine what requirements are needed for those features to be satisfied. Okay, so what are these properties? The first one is permutation equivalence, something that we have already encountered when introducing graph neural networks. So just to have in mind, right? So in graph neural networks, we can easily represent them with an adjacency matrix, the graph structure, and let's say that P is just some genetic permutation matrix. So P, A, P transpose is just relabeling the nodes. Then whatever we learn, if the operation is permutation equivalence, it must be impervious to this permutation matrix. So one can define this formally, we do not get stuck with the notation here, because the picture is actually quite uh, simple, which is the following is, let's say that you have one of these architectures, and you apply it to some input CJ. If you grab that architecture and you permute the nodes and edges and triangles, et cetera, and correspondingly permute your inputs, what you want to get is a permuted version of what you had before. So if this is the case, then the architecture is permutation equivalence and graph neural networks are. So we want these to also be when we think in terms of higher order structures. This is the first one. The second one is orientation equivalence, which is inspired by that skew symmetry property that we talked about uh, some minutes ago. So the boundary operators indeed assume an orientation for each simplex. Right? So you recall when we had this example, three times uh, one, two, two, blah, blah, blah. This was you know, assuming that this is indeed oriented one, two, right? So there's a head and a tail. If we would have chosen, and this is an arbitrary choice, if we have chosen the basis two one, then the same information would have been encoded as a minus three. So that when you take the um, del operator over here, you get actually the same output over there. So that if we focus only on the data, right, the three or the minus three is actually arbitrary. Okay, so we wouldn't want our architecture to depend on our arbitrary decision on whether orient things one, two, or two, one. Okay. Essentially, this means that if we just reorient things, we want to get a reoriented output of what we had originally gotten. And again, here one can define, just like we did with permutation equivalence, one can define this formally, but the picture to have in mind is the same as before. If we have our simplicial complex network, which is applied to some input CJ, and now what we grab is that simplicial complex network, but applied to a reoriented simplicial complex. We just change the orientations and we change the 
orientation of my input as well, right? So we change the three by a minus three in, in a consistent manner with the, orient, with the reoriented simplicial complex. And we apply the same architecture. What we want to get on the other side is just a reoriented version of what we had at the beginning. In that way, we are sure that what we're constructing will not depend on our arbitrary orientation scheme. So this is the second property, orientation covariance. And the third property that we want to promote is that of simplicial awareness. So this one is a little bit uh, more uh, tricky. So what, what, what do I mean by this? So think of a graph neural network as a simplicial complex network. So you could have a very complicated simplicial complex and then an architecture that focuses only on the graph skeleton of that, and it's a graph neural network. That we don't want to think of that as being a very good simplicial complex network because it's completely ignoring this higher order information. So we say that a, simpl a simplicial complex is simplicial aware if it can extract information from higher order uh, levels if it is useful for the task at hand. Okay. If it's completely uninformative, it is okay to ignore it. We don't want to force it to use that information. But at least it must have the ability to use that higher order information, which is something that operates only on the graph skeleton of a simplicial complex network uh, would not have. So the way to encode this, again, is a, a little bit uh, more tricky. But the picture to have in mind is, is this. Right? So if you have if you have your simplicial complex network that is applied on, let's say one, one simplicial complex defined by these delta operators and another one with the delta prime, and those two complexes only define at the, at the kth level, maybe they have the same nodes on the same edges, but different triangles, then there must exist at least some input CJ and some, um, and some weights W so that the output is different. So there is some way of seeing that the triangles are different between these two things, right? If the simplicial complex network is completely myopic to the triangles, then that wouldn't exist. Right? It's not that you have to use it for your task at hand, right? But at least for some input and some weight, uh, some weights W, these two must differ. Right? And if that is true for any K, then we say that the architecture is simplicial aware. So that's the, that's the essence of this. <clears throat> so before introducing then an admissible architecture, which is something that defines these three properties we just introduced, let me introduce the task that we'll be discussing and why it kind of makes sense in our context. And it's that of trajectory prediction. So given observations of an agent moving along a path, like this one over here, we want to predict where it will move locally in the future, okay? So trajectories are naturally modeled using a Hodgson fashion. So you can think of triangulating that space or discretizing that space. And what we have is this trajectory, which is some sort of signal in the edges, which are the edges that we traversed so far. And then the output is which is the next node that we'll be stepping on. Maybe just one hop or will we, where will we be in two, in two steps, etc. Some, some information at the nodes. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Hodge theory can nicely model this sort of trajectory because trajectories, you know, they tend to be conservative. You know, whenever you get into a node, you probably get out of that node mostly. Um, and curl, curl free, right? So a trajectory like that might not be very efficient. So in a lot of applications, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay. So you will see that there will be some subspaces within this space of trajectories that will be better suited to describe our data and to generalize them to unseen data. Good. So now let's define a specific architecture that we call SCONE, so Simplicial Complex Network. We'll be using SCONE for trajectory prediction. And as we said, there will be a map from C1 to C0, right? Because we're given a bunch of information in my edges and want to predict something at the nodes, which is what is the next node or nodes in two steps, etc. So what is the architecture over here? It's a very simple convolutional architecture. So let me try to... Uh, describe it. So it's going to be a layered architecture. It's going to have capital L layers. And each layer 
will have the structure that we see in here in equation in block form. Let me start with block. So this is the inputs to the elf layer, little elf layer. And here we're gonna have these three oper operations. First, kind of doing nothing. So here we're gonna stay at the edge level, right? So this is an edge uh, signal, we stay at the edge level. Here we go to the triangles and back. And here we go to the nodes and back up. Then we're gonna sum these, pass it through nonlinearity, and we'll get the next, the input to my next layer. So the equation is this, right? So we have the input here is just replicated. Here we have an identity, here we don't do anything. Here we go to triangles and back, to nodes and back. And for each of these operations, we have this trainable weights W. This trainable weights. So here notice that this term plus that term, these two terms add up to the Hutchins Lashing. But here kind of we are partitioning the Hutchins Lashing to these two pieces just because one is nicely um, modeling curl flows and the other one nicely modeling gradient flows. So it makes sense to have different learnable weights associated with these two different types of flows. So we apply this for capital L layers. And then after capital L such layers, we want to project back into node space. And for that, simply we grab the health output, we project it back into node space with some just trainable weights as well. And then if we want to restrict this signal, which will be a signal on the nodes, in all of the nodes, we want to restrict it to a subset of candidates, we can, right? so we're doing some sort of softmax or something. So this is what we do. So before showing some results, first let's talk about the admissibility of SCON, whether SCON satisfies the three properties, permutation equivalence, orientation equivalence, implicit awareness or not. And here, an interesting result is that let's assume that the nonlinearity phi is continuous and applied element-wise, since these things usually are, then if SCON is admissible, it must mean that phi is odd and indeed a nonlinear activation. It cannot be linear. So this is kind of cool because it gives us a principled approach towards choosing this nonlinearity in our architecture. So the first, it gives us a theoretical justification for using nonlinearities at all. Right? So this is not that just nonlinearities are useful for images, so let's use it here. Right? So nonlinearities are useful because they make our architecture admissible given the properties that we defined. So this is, this is not just a whim, whimsical choice. It also guides the choice of the specific phi. So it has to be odd. In our case, we'll be choosing tan H, hyperbolic tangent. So it's not that we're gonna be using ReLUS just because they work well in images, right? because that would be not a good choice for, for this kind of architectures as we'll see in an application in a second. And what we'll try to indeed um, show and illustrate is that admissibility promotes high performance and uh, generalizability. Good. So now let me uh, spend some time demonstrating that this is the case through some experiments. So in this case, we're gonna do trajectory prediction. So we, this will be our domain here on the left. This is say, some plane that has two holes, this, this hole over here, that hole over there, and has been triangulated. So we have nodes, we have edges, and all the purple faces are actually filled in triangles. So that the simplicial complex essentially knows that there's a hole in there and a hole in there because there, there are no faces. In there. Uh, the whole other thing has faces. And then we're gonna generate information. Right? So kind of our training data will be trajectories of three types. And all of them will choose you know, a point here. Let's say for type one, we'll choose a point in this part of space and another point in that part of space, some uniformly at random within that subset of nodes. And then we'll join them through shortest paths. And then we'll generate another type by just you know, picking something here, something here, and something here. And then a third type of trajectory, choosing something there, something there, and something there, and joining them through shortest path. Let's say we generate whatever, a thousand all in all of these trajectories. We're gonna train our architecture on those. And then during testing, we'll be given um, partial trajectory. For example, we're told that we have a trajectory that goes all the way through there up to that point. And we need to determine what is going to be the next node that this trajectory will visit based on the training information and the structure of the simplicial complex. Okay, so these are task at hand. 
we're going to be comparing a few different methods to try to solve this task. First, something that was essentially modeling the these walks as Markov chains. So that once you get to a node, it doesn't matter where you came from, and and you'll just predict the most uh, probable node next, essentially the node that you've observed coming most times after this node in your training data. Then an RNN, right? So there's a very clear sequential nature to this problem. So you can try to solve it with an RNN. And then a bunch of different architectures that are based on the construction that we did today. Scone with different activation functions. And then the tan H, no triangles, meaning completely ignoring the triangular, the triangles in the simplicial complex, only focusing on the graph. And then these two other things are essentially projecting our flows into the kernel space, the kernel space of the Hodge ablation and the kernel space of del one, which is that of the Hodge ablation by ignoring triangles again. So there's nothing learnable there. It's just a projection into kernel space and that's it. Right? So it's less sophisticated than school. Good. And here, this will be the standard task that we just described. Here we're gonna see the performance of this. Okay. And the first thing that we see, so remember here, SCON 10H is the thing that we want to uh, you know, propose that we're deriving. This is uh, rather anticlimactic. Right? So we've been talking for 35 minutes at this point, building this up, and it looks like an RNN is doing better. Right? So the, this is slightly anticlimactic. But of course, the story doesn't end there. So what we are building here is something that generalizes well. So let's do two different, slightly more sophisticated experiments here. And still note that this is you know, comparable, right? So it's not that it fails completely. But now let's look at a different task, which is one where the training is the same, but the testing is reversed. So now the testing trajectories go in the opposite direction. So now I'm at that point, I want to predict the next point. But I've never seen direction, a, a trajectory in that direction during training. So in that case, things like uh, Markov and RNN fail miserably right? because they know that they have to go in the opposite direction. So once you get to that point, you try to go still up rather than noticing that these are the same kind of trajectories, but just traversed in the opposite direction. So then uh, things built on top of the hot ablation, like scone and these projections do quite nicely in those cases. And I think what it's maybe even more interesting is this transfer uh, learning setting where the training contains only these two types of trajectories. Okay, So those two types of trajectories. The architecture has never seen trajectories going below that bottom obstacle over there. And then during testing, we test on these kind of trajectories. So for those cases, these other, let's say, more classical methods cannot do anything. It will be just random guessing because they are not leveraging the structure of the simplicial complex at all. So if, if you've arrived as an edge that I've never seen before, I have no idea where you're going. On the other hand, things again, based on the hodge ablation and this architecture that we built, transfer very naturally to unseen cases. Right? Why is that the case? Well, because it's not only learning and memorizing trajectories. What it's learning is what kind of trajectories appear in the training set. These trajectories tend to be conservative, tend to be curl-free, etc. So even if you are giving me a new trajectory that goes through a part of the simplicial complex that I've never seen before, I would still try to project the next space into the next node so that they falls into the right space of trajectories and can still transfer them to these unseen portions of the data. Mm -hmm. Good. So that is this experiment over here. The next experiment that I want to show, and then of course we'll have um, plenty of time for questions, is about um, the choice of the nonlinearity. Right? So we said that tan H is good because it's odd and that implies admissibility. In particular, it implies this orientation equivalence of the admissibility. And you can see why that might be the case, right? Because if ReLU, something that is ReLU, if I have an orientation where my flow is plus three, it will act differently than if I choose an orientation where my flow is minus three. 
but tan h would act the same. So that's why, of course, you need it to be odd. Okay, so here let's do the following. The same experiment as before, the same experiment as before, but we're gonna choose the orientation of the edges is per purposely chosen so that most of them are pointing in that direction. So we essentially choose the x, y coordinates of nodes and then point and sum them and then point in the direction where that sum is larger. Right? So then if you think of you know, x and y here, then most edges will be oriented that way. Okay? So that during my training, most of the flows, when we represent the, the red flows over here in that basis, most of them will have a plus one. Okay? So most of the information will be positive in sign. So if we do that and we do kind of that standard experiment that we mentioned before of, of then cutting a, a trajectory and trying to predict when it's gonna move next, then really it doesn't matter which nonlinearity you choose as long as the orientation in the, in the training and testing are, are the same and they are still going the same direction. Now, if we do that reversed operation, we're now during testing, we observe trajectories that go in the opposite direction. Then the prediction should be a negative number in the basis that goes always in that direction, right? And then something that's tan H can indeed predict negative numbers, no problem. But then ReLU and sigmoid that are, non, that are not odd completely fail. So in this case, we see the power of the architecture being admissible versus not. And then we also tested a scone. So these are you know, synthetic experiments, but I think they're uh, pretty motivating in the sense that they nicely illustrate these properties we, were, we mentioned and, and developed today. But we also test, tested scone on, on real world buoy data around Madagascar. Right? So there you have the island of Madagascar is your obstacle, and then you have buoys moving in the ocean around them. Of course, they cannot go through the earth, right? So through the land. So then you will tend to have kind of these harmonic conservative flows you know, around the, the island, and maybe some of them just diverging there. And we also looked at trajectories in Berlin. So there the trajectories were synthetic, but the, the map of Berlin was the true one. And the reason why we did that was you know, because triangulation is cool, but people don't move in triangles, especially in cities, right? So people tend to move more in, in, in squares or rectangles, right? Just because blocks tend to have those, uh, those shapes. And uh, for, for to do that, then we need to extend SCON and this analysis and go beyond simplicial complexes, which are naturally built on triangles, to more general CW or cell complexes, where you have complexes that are again like rectangles or squares or, or different, uh, different faces to your complex architecture. And everything that we talked today carry over very naturally to these more general constructions. Good. So with that, so we're, yeah, so we can still have five minutes for questions, so great. So uh, to conclude, we have a key element of graph neural network is permutation equivariance. And in general methods that respect invariances can transfer and scale well. So what we did today is we considered additional symmetries, orientation equivariance, which is something that naturally arises when thinking about signals on edges and higher orders, and is not present when thinking about signals in nodes and truly accounting for higher order structure, simplicial awareness, not ignoring the higher order structures, but at least having the ability to use information in those if beneficial for the task at hand, then we can construct principled and generalizable neural networks for data supported on simplicial complexes. Uh, thanks all uh, for, for attending the talk. There's more on this on our, this was actually based on an ICML paper from last year, and it was a homonym paper, same, same name as this talk. And again, written by Mitch Rodenberry, Nick Lace, and myself. I'll be happy to take uh, questions now. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Seguera. Um, I would like to encourage audience if they may, uh, if they have any questions, they may ask. Yes, I see that's uh, one hand erased. That's, that's Yes, Professor Segura. My name is Conrad, and I'm from National Research Council in Canada. Very nice presentation. So, I have a question for you: Is that what do you use as the structure for your nodes? So, when you define your graph, your graph, 
Why do you use a descriptor for your node and also for the edges? What are the descriptors for the nodes and the edges? Is that the question? Like what are yes. the features of it? Yeah. yeah. So how do you consider the local environment of each node in order to in the time? Right. Uh, yeah. So here, right. So in, in I mean, the, so the the structure themselves, right. So we so scone builds on a simplicial complex structure that we think of it as being given. Right? So the when we uh, when we were given is actually a let's say a plane with two holes, like in this case, then we just choose some triangulation, like a Delaunay triangulation in this case, and then indeed the nodes. Are right, so the nodes are here what you see as nodes, and then the edges are just these lines. So then the neighboring structure is just given by what are the nodes that are immediately neighbors to it in this triangulation. And so that, that's how we choose the, the, the neighborings. And the nodes themselves, in this case, they have no features, right? They have no okay, no axis to them, right? You could indeed incorporate this is a good question, right? So you could indeed incorporate. And some people have done this on graphs, but they, of course they can do the institutional complex without any problem. Things like if you are if you are trajectories in Berlin, right, let's say that they are maybe car trajectories or people, then all of the edges are not created equally. Right? Some yep. some roads are are broader, you know, some some are thinner, some have different velocity speed limits, etc. So all of those you would then incorporate as as features of your edges. Um, that, that then yeah then you can just like in a convolutional architecture then you can try to put those as input and then just operate locally on those through an architecture like scone or something similar okay thank you yeah you're welcome uh, i see that uh, hamid has a hand hi hamid very nice to see you here hi uh Santiago, how are you? Good, good to good, very good talk. I have a question. How sensitive, or did you look at that sensitivity of your training to the type of trajectory you had, uh, you know, sort of put down in the first place? And what I'm particularly thinking of is, for instance, suppose that actually your initial data, your training data, had not uh, actually sort of gone around your uh, obstacles, mm -hmm. or your holes here, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, rather just went kind of on on the edges. Uh, uh, then what what happens? Yeah. So here, um, and and I know that you are you know very, very familiar with with the idea of you know topological data analysis and thinking about holes, etc. Right. So here, essentially having architectures that are indeed based on uh, something like the Hodge Laplacian allows you to work a little bit on this uh, homotopy space in a, in a sense, right? So that if two trajectories, you know, the, tra the, blue, the red trajectory we have here and the blue trajectory that we have there right, are going to be way more similar than the Blue trajectory and this and this um, orange trajectory or yellow trajectory over there, just because they are different homotopy type. So, if we were to plot kind of the three the three red trajectories over here and the and the blue one as well, like this new blue one. Apart from how far away they are on the graph, the fact that the two in the middle belong to, again, to the same homotopy type will make them very close in this uh, space that is the projection of the Hodge Laplacian. So back to, your, back to your question, right? So if trajectories would tend to do, let's say, one whole round around the hole before going to the next uh, stop, then you would essentially learn that that is the higher level, higher order the kind of feature of the trajectory. You probably don't care too much about you know what is the minute detail of how this thing is doing a whole turn, but you just learn that it just takes a turn. And if you even you could maybe transfer, and this is not an experiment that we did, so take this with a grain of salt. But maybe even if you haven't seen this lower part, but all the things that you see are kind of take a whole turn around an obstacle before proceeding, it might be the case that you learn even without seeing those that you would take a turn around this obstacle. Uh, before proceeding to your final point. 
right? So at least in my in my view, it kind of helps you learn these more broader descriptors of trajectories based on holes to the left, to the right, around, etc., as opposed to focusing just like something like an RNN or a Markov with essentially focusing or the minute details of which is the edge that comes after one edge, etc. Yeah, maybe we can have discussion offline. Uh, I, I, I still have uh, questions about it. Okay. Yeah, 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 of course. I'll be yeah, more than happy. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you an email later and we can maybe have sure. a talk. Thank you. Awesome. Thank Great. you, Hamid. No, thank you. Uh, yes, maybe Francesco. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I have a question. So, practical question is in your application trajectory pro um, prediction, is the input uh, the state of the all uh, all mm -hmm. symplectic, symplectic complex, uh, or it's uh, just one edge? Uh, and the second question is about uh, what are the application. Uh, do you see for this uh, sim simplistic uh, description? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the um, so the input is, for example, when you're trying to do trajectory prediction, the input is the trajectory up to that point. Right. For example, if if you have the trajectory all the way up to here and you want to predict where it's going to go next, the input is essentially a signal on the edge space that has a one here, 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 and zero everywhere else. So it's zero in every other edge that you have not visited. And then you want to determine where you're going next. So that, that's the input to the architecture. Right? The, the, the simplicial complex itself, the structure is given and fixed, and then the data input is that. Right? Yeah. Is that good? Okay. And then um, in terms of other applications. Yeah, so in general, so here I'm going to say two things, right? So the simplicial complex way of thinking, I think it's uh, relatively broadly applicable in the sense that there are many cases where you want to have relations that go beyond pairwise, as I said before, in terms of maybe group communications, this co-citation or so co-authorship networks, etc. In those cases, this kind of architectures can be applied. The flow kind of the Hodge decomposition itself, you can still use a Hodge operator for something that is not really encoding a flow. Right? But the fact that the Hodge decomposition is very nicely related to this harmonic gradient and curl uh, tends to mean that this, this works nicely for flow problems. Okay, So it need not be prediction. It could be kind of any sort of inverse problem. Or it could be some sort of denoising of flow. It could be interpolation of flow, kind of different sort of problems in, in flow land. This thing tends to work better, even though that need not be the case. Okay, these edges could be some other feature of the edges that you're predicting. Okay, you could still try it in those cases, but again, the Hodge decomposition will not be natural in those, right? So they still could learn something, but it's not particularly designed for learning those things. Thank you.